I want you to imagine that you have a car that you never have to fill up with fuel, you never have to plug it in for electricity. Um, and that's the idea behind the solar powered car. It's a vehicle that's covered with solar panels that converts sunlight directly to electricity. The electricity powers the motor that drives the car. When the car is idle, ideally the solar panels would continue to generate electricity which is stored in a battery. And then, the ba then when it's cloudy or even dark, um, the car could theoretically run. And for those of you who have been at Stanford over the last few years, you may have on occasion seen this very futuristic looking vehicle drive around campus. It looks something like a flying saucer on wheels. This is not a UFO. This is a solar car. And the Stanford Solar Car Project, this is the 25th anniversary of the founding of the project, or this academic year, I should say. They uh, build a solar car to compete in something called the World Solar Challenge, an event that occurs every two years in Australia where universities from around the world build these cars and they drive about 2,000 miles across the outback and see who comes in first, powered only on the sun. And Stanford has been competing in this since 1993. Teams want to finish in the top three. Um, for 20 years, Stanford had never even gotten into the top five. So it's a very tough race. In fact, most of the teams don't even finish the race. It's so grueling. The next World Solar Challenge in Australia is going to be in October. So there's a new team that's building a new car. Um, in the summer of 2013, I was asked by my office at the Priest Court Institute, because I shoot video, do, do you want to go to Australia and document the, the race? And I said, sure, I've never been to Australia. So I did that. And I discovered that this project, which I don't think a lot of people really know much about it, except they see this strange car every once in a while, could be one of the most important undergraduate projects on campus. It's kind of like an underground <laughs> event known within many high-tech fields. And I realized this when I encountered two Google recruiters who had flown from California to recruit engineers and other students to Google from all sorts of teams from all over the world. Um, so to give people a sense of what the project about, is about, I put together this documentary that ended up being about 45 minutes long. I don't think any film should be more than a minute and 10 seconds, but there you go. <laughs> you might agree when you see this. I don't know. <laughs> this is the premiere showing. We're fortunate to have many members of the 2013 team and 2015 team, and some, some were and are on both teams. As, as uh, Pachira said, there will be, um, oh, we're going to have a short discussion, panel discussion with several team members after the film. And about 5.30, there will be the um, um, reception outside, which hopefully many of the team members can stick around and we'll answer more of your questions. So again, I remind you to please turn off your cell phones. And with that, we will show the video. I'm not sure how we're going to do that, but oh, you're going to <laughs> Good. So, I don't know. Thank you. Solar car is a all-encompassing, all-consuming pursuit. Everything else goes out the window. Girlfriend, parents, friends. One, two, three. Eating, <laughs> sleeping, certainly. It was worth it because it changed my life completely. When you make something and you can see it working, it's just amazing. Actually being out there and driving a car that you built yourself is just incredible. Most of the students on our team find it really easy to find uh, really great jobs uh, when they graduate from Stanford. So we have folks that go into companies like Boeing or SpaceX, Tesla. The solar car experience was the most important thing I did at Stanford. There will be classes that you took that you don't remember at all. But going to Australia and driving your car across a continent under the power of the sun and only under the power of the sun together with your friends is a defining experience that you will remember until the day you die.
So I'm really excited to be here today. Uh, we're here to celebrate our 25 year history at the Sanford Solar Car Project. The Stanford Solar Car Project was founded in 1989 here at Stanford by some really driven engineering students. It's an entirely student run group. What we do is we design, build, test, and then finally race solar powered vehicles. So we compete every two years in something known as the World Solar Challenge. It's a really large event held in Australia. We are required to drive 2,000 miles across the entire Australian outback just using solar power alone. It's a really competitive event. It's really difficult. This past race was one of the most exciting in our recent history. Our latest car, Luminos, which raced in the 2013 World Solar Challenge, this very grueling race, it did very well. We're here at the start of the 2013 World Solar Challenge. Over the next couple of days, our team will be driving uh, around 2,000 miles across the Australian Outback. We think we have a very robust vehicle that's also efficient. Uh, so we're looking for a uh, top five finish, hopefully, in this year's race. The race itself has teams from about uh, over 20 other countries. It allows you to see that there are like uh, really good engineers and meet really good engineers from every country and every continent in the world. And I really think that's a really cool part of the experience. This year we had uh, 15 or 16 team members from Stanford um, that are participating in the race. I, I do love World Solar Challenge. It's so pure as a race. Just point A to point B, first one there wins. Uh, point A to point B happened to be 2,000 miles apart across the most inhospitable land on the planet. I love that. I found that I really like collaborative engineering. I have a lot of fun because I get to work with a, a lot of really smart people at Stanford. Um, I'm a rising sophomore at Stanford. I'm majoring in mechanical engineering. Try going a little, like a few degrees more vertical. Okay, stop. I've actually taken three quarters off for solar car. I will finish in five years, which will be 12 quarters of school. And my major is computer science. I'll be a fifth year senior when I get back from this race in computer science. So I'm an economics major at Stanford, and uh, I've been spending the last uh, two years working on this vehicle, Luminos, and I also raced with the team in 2011. There are three classes that compete in the World Solar Challenge. The class that we competed in is the Challenger class, and that is straightforward racing. You have one person in the car, you're trying to go as fast as you can. All the teams uh, begin in Darwin, uh, which is on the northern coast of Australia. And from there on, the teams are racing head-to-head -to, -head to Adelaide, which is the finish line of the race. Darwin in Australia is a very special place in the minds of a lot of people on our team. It's in the subtropics, so it's hot, it's humid. There's a lot of mosquitoes and other bugs. And then on top of that, there's crocodiles, plenty of dangerous, poisonous things. Uh, we usually set up ourselves in a hostel. The majority of our time in Darwin is spent at a racetrack called Hidden Valley, focused on doing last minute preparations for the race itself. I'm from the Stanford Solar Car Project. I'm an electrical engineer on the project and I've been working with the team for about two and a half years. I, I joined actually about exactly a year ago um, and just the fact that I'm you know, here in Australia now is pretty crazy. In the World Solar Challenge, uh, the teams that uh, place in the top three will actually receive um, recognition and a big medal. So basically the gold, silver and bronze teams are kind of the, uh, the top teams the next two years throughout the globe. For the last Six or so races, there's been two teams that have uh, traded back and forth winning the World Solar Challenge. The Dutch team, uh, Nuon, uh, and also uh, the Japanese team, Tokai. And then uh, the University of Michigan is also another top team. Uh, they've consistently been in the top three. There's always naturally a little bit of a com competition between Michigan and Stanford. We, <laughs> we were focused on them, we wanted to beat them. Uh, they wanted to beat us. That's a good rivalry. Michigan is a fantastic team, and Michigan provided all the incentive we needed to sort of pull those extra late nights. We were kind of in the dark with respect to Twente. We had gotten to know these guys, and um, they're really funny people. Yeah, definitely one of the fastest teams in the whole race. Very good team, master students. In the Netherlands, they take a year and a half off to do it. They build a beautiful car, race is very fast. One of the cool things about our team is that we're completely student-run, and our university uh, involvement is really there to support us, not to direct us. A lot of these other teams are run by professors. They're either completely or mostly grad student uh, composed. And it was really cool for us to see how these other teams are run that were really uh, a lot older than us, a lot more experienced.
Right now we're at uh, Darwin Showgrounds where they're staging the event scrutineering where all the teams that are competing in the race this year go through about four hours of regulation checks with the officials for the race. Not related to famous Henry Ford by any chance? Not that I know of. One of the first stations that our team goes through is a battery check station. Uh, at high noon, when the sun is uh, high above the sky, our team will use a solar array to charge those batteries so that at the end of the day and in the early morning when the sun is low in the sky, we can still cruise at the same speed using the extra energy stored in our battery pack. I'm curious to see what other teams have for their battery packs. Uh, most teams keep them pretty under wraps. This was just a station to go through and you put an uh, orange string across the pack so that if we were to tamper with any cells, uh, it would be obvious that something had happened. It's just sort of a safety check that they have, that teams are following the rules. Um, hopefully in the course of the race, we'll never open the battery pack again, and we'll open it in Adelaide, and the string will still be on, no problems. Thank you very right. much. It's Thank you. Lovely looking. Thank you. Delighted to see it, so good luck in the event. Great, thanks. I'm expecting big things of you. <laughs> we'll see, we've been practicing. One of my main projects was building the battery pack mechanically. Uh, Max Praglin did the electronics and Rachel Fenichel did the code. Merry Christmas, have a battery pack. Oh yeah, okay, got it. You start the, the race with a full pack. You're fully charged in Darwin and you end the race with an empty pack. So some days later. So you don't discharge to zero every day and you don't recharge to full every day. My other role on the team as of recently has been working on our race strategy and uh, part of that is having good models of the car. So I've worked very carefully to identify how the car performs in different conditions and then use that information to decide how fast we drive the car. If you go faster you're actually burning quite a bit more. Sometimes it'll be better to go uh, faster by one kilometer an hour over a long period of time rather than faster by five or ten over a short period. It depends on what your strategy guys are saying you should do, it depends on what you think the weather will be ahead and whether you have to outrun clouds, stuff like that. Three, two, one, go. One of the more fun parts of scrutineering is the driver egress test, whereupon the driver must be seated inside the car with their seatbelt on and get out of the car and I believe it's 12 seconds. But the way it works is you get locked in the car and you have your your harness on and your helmet on and the radio and they give you a countdown. Three, two, one, go. And then the timer starts and you have to get out all by yourself. A lot of things could go wrong that require a driver to get out of the car immediately. Um, most obvious being some sort of a fire in the electronics or in the battery systems, which do happen. With Luminos, it was pretty easy to get in and out of. Uh, some folks actually have to transform from designers to race car drivers uh, like Anna. Anna Olson, one of the roles that you played in Australia was that of driver. And can you, can you explain for everybody what is the experience like of driving Luminos? One of the most challenging parts about driving the solar car is that it's extremely boring. Your only job is to sit there and keep the car between two straight lines on the road. There's basically no air movement inside the car. You're basically sitting in a little black carbon fiber box. It's, uh, it's definitely unpleasant, um, objectively speaking, but at the same time, um, you're driving a solar car <laughs> across Australia. Um, that part never gets old for me. Our organization has kind of a dual purpose between providing uh, educational experience for the students on the project and making a really high performance vehicle. Should I redesign this? Should I do something new? It would be a little more educational for my members. So really um, navigating the trade-off between good race performance and uh, doing things that are new is probably the toughest challenge. My name is Alex Tilson. I'm a 1992 graduate of Stanford. So I was at the very first meeting that the Stanford Solar Car Project has ever had. Um, it was freshman year, 1989. Uh, no one had built a solar car before. Uh, it's first uh, drive we're doing in Australia. I was the first to take the, 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 the car to Australia and uh, the World Solar Challenge in November of 93, where we were 13th, I believe, out of 40 that started, roughly. And that remained the Stanford speed record across Australia for, for 20 years, much to our surprise. The teams that went subsequently didn't finish. I know at our company, um, our entrepreneurial success, I, I, I partially relate back to the solar car experiences. It taught me a lot as a leader, taught me a lot as a manager, taught me a lot as an entrepreneur, taught me a lot as an engineer. You know, the solar car team and technologies are usually ahead of their time in terms of looking at the next best generation of batteries, the best solar panels, 
best motors and efficient you know, converters, things like that. Most of my involvement with uh, the solar car team was toward the end of when I was at Stanford. I had many friends that were part of that team throughout uh, my time there and I recruited most of the people from the team when we started Tesla. It was a key thing in the beginning of Tesla. I think it matters more than, than most classes you can take. I mean, it's one of the things that even today at Tesla we look at on resumes and place it you know, higher than perhaps GPA or even perhaps you know, higher than you know, what classes they decided here and there. So the process of getting our solar car from basically a blank sheet of paper with um, no ideas yet to having a vehicle that can be ready to race across the Australian Outback takes our team about 18 months. It's a very quick cycle. We'll spend about three months doing preliminary design work once we get to uh, the midfall, we'll start doing some of the manufacturing work. The vast majority of the components in the vehicle we actually manufacture here on the Stanford campus. For example, the carbon fiber composites, we ramp that up in the late fall going into the winter. Basically the entire vehicle's composite uh, monocoque chassis and exterior shell is made out of carbon fiber. We have a lot of titanium components in the vehicle. We have very high efficiency solar cells on the top of our vehicle and the solar array. And our team usually spends about two or three months doing testing uh, here in California for the most part. For example, we'll spend a lot of time in the Central Valley where there's a lot of open farmland where our team can do testing that's a lot more similar to the Australian Outback. We've also done some wind tunnel testing in the past, even out in uh, North Carolina. Key word for that cycle is testing, testing, testing. We actually put the full length of the race on the car in test miles in the United States, which is a challenge most teams haven't been able to accomplish. This year our team was very fortunate in that we had a couple hundred great sponsors that supported our team. Altogether, the program this cycle had about $1.6 million worth of parts and cash that were donated to our program. Of that, maybe $400,000 was cash. Um, and the rest were parts that were donated to our team. For example, Panasonic was one of our big sponsors this year that provided battery cells for our vehicle. So the Stanford team assembled hundreds of our cells into ver uh, various blocks. Those blocks were assembled into a battery pack and they did uh, all of the integration themselves complete with a battery management system. And this is an amazing effort considering these are young adults, uh, many of them not even officially graduated yet, uh, and uh, being able to pull this off was really, I think, quite magical. Another one of our big sponsors was uh, ST Microelectronics uh, that provided a lot of the uh, integrated circuits for our vehicle this cycle. These microprocessors are kind of the center of what our software team works on. And this is a, a little integrated circuit that we use on pretty much every circuit board on the car. The invisible software that just makes everything on the car work and have all the different elements on the car talk to each other. We've been sponsoring it for I believe six years now, okay, and we'll continue to support it because now I'm, we're very involved, right? And it actually goes quite fast. I, mean, I accelerated, I thought I'd scare the crowd by driving at them and they, they got the message, get out of the way. This way. It was great, no, it was good fun, good experience. What, what, what I was fascinated by was how they do everything on this car from, from scratch. It's an amazing achievement for undergraduates. They have to still study and get their uh, homework in, as we all know, okay, on time and get their projects done. At the end of the day, it's also a lot of fun. And I think that's what comes across. They really enjoy it and are very enthusiastic. And, and that's it. And, and, and like all semiconductor companies, there is, you know, there's a method in our madness. You know, we're a European company. We're in the middle of California. What better place to get become famous is with the next generation of engineers, right? You know, teach, catch them early, as they say. <laughs> So it's, a, it's a fantastic project to be involved in, it really is. It's better than I, even I expected. I mean, people have been telling me about it for years, but now I've been up close and personal, if you like. It's, it's impressive, really impressive. For the, the summer, um, our big deadline in the sand was to get the car in a boat seven weeks before we needed it in Australia. Um, usually our team will ocean ship our car because that's uh, the most cost-effective way. This last year I tried to make a big effort to try to find a corporate sponsor that could support our team with air shipping, but I had very little success for months on end until I, I got some inroads with uh, Virgin Australia and Virgin Atlantic. Air shipping is something we always talked about doing, but it's, it's hard. And Wesley manages all in the background to get this sponsorship. It reinforces the opinion that he's magical. Wesley was amazing at logistics. So the solar car turn left here. Okay. Okay. So the solar car could proceed. Beautiful. Greg was great for technical advice, for knowledge. <laughs> Coffee. And they were just both fun people to be around. Coffee. Mm. Egg. <laughs> Coffee. <laughs>
they did a fantastic job. So with our team, uh, we definitely have a lot of uh, very passionate, strong personalities. Yeah, because the thing is, every time water drips out, we're wasting water. But fortunately, uh, this year we had a very strongly knit group of students that were out in Australia. Uh, by the time we got to the race, we were really functioning as a well-oiled machine. The car is still on. Fortunately for us, uh, Stanford University provides cash support but we still uh, operate on a pretty tight budget when we're in Australia. We weren't dining out every night, but no, we're not starving. And also, this is partly because the team tries to put most of our money into racing. You can live on pb &J for a while. The one large expense that our team members uh, have to personally uh, cover is the flight ticket to Australia. And for many members of the team, um, that's a barrier that prevents folks from being able to go to Australia to experience uh, racing in the outback. In addition to the solar car itself, our team has a convoy vehicle that we use to support the race car. So this year Volkswagen provided us uh, with four vehicles to use and our team picked up those vehicles in Melbourne, Australia. The first vehicle that we have in our convoy we call the Scout Car. For one, the Scout vehicle is responsible for collecting live weather data just ahead of our team and reporting that back to the rest of the convoy. They'll also report if there's any kind of new road hazards we wouldn't expect. Australia does have a lot of kangaroos, and they're actually primarily nocturnal creatures, so they'll kind of get attracted to this road surface at night when the road is warm and the weather's cooled down a bit. The problem with this is that there's road trains, these three or four trailer long uh, semi-truck uh, configurations. What they have adopted is, uh, they'll call them roo guards, where it's just a steel grate in front of the truck. They won't stop because they can't stop, and they'll just run these kangaroos down. And, and you know, it happens, there's roadkill on the road, and we have to navigate that the next day. The next vehicle in the convoy is called the lead vehicle, and this vehicle will run maybe 500 yards in front of the solar car itself. And then just behind the solar car is the chase vehicle. And the chase vehicle is usually kind of the headquarters of our race convoy. And then the final vehicle that we have in our convoy is our trailer vehicle, which we use to carry all of our tents, all of our camping gear, and also some of our race equipment as well. All the teams today got a chance to race their cars around the Hidden Valley racetrack, and the team's racing time on the racetrack uh, is what the officials use to determine the grid order for this year's race. Well, it's a little bit nerve-wracking to be the one doing the hot lap, uh, just because the whole team's kind of <laughs> counting on you. Everyone's worked really hard uh, to get us here. Uh, the Stanford team did very well. We came in with a two-minute, seven-second race time. That was the third fastest in the challenge class. So that means that we'll be placed uh, third car at the start of the grid for this upcoming race. So the day before the race, I felt ready, and I know a number of other people on the team have also felt ready. I've been doing solar car for four years, and this is probably my last shot at it. So today is race day. It's a little surreal to be here. We're all obviously very pumped up, a lot of adrenaline flowing. None of us have slept all night, waking every hour in anticipation of the day. We're just really excited. It's, it's going to be a great race and a wonderful way to see Australia. We hope to win. I'm excited, our team's excited. Uh, feeling good, got a good night of sleep and uh, we're ready for a long race. You kind of start to reflect a little bit on 18 months of everything. I mean, the, the sleepless nights, the joy of something working, the bickering about what is the best design, what's not the best design, just the, I mean, the agony and the ecstasy of it all. So my uh, parents have decided to come to be the, uh, as they call it, drive the chuck wagon for the team. Like my wife says, we're uh, chief cooks and bottle washers. <laughs> we're making sure that the team Stays, uh, so stays full. We're the cookies. <laughs> uh, they'll be making our food and just handling the food logistics for the whole trip. Uh, the nice thing about that is it means the team doesn't have to worry about food. They can take a, a big chunk of work off of the team and leave us to sleep and make sure the car goes really fast. Really excited. It's been a long process, you know, and here we are. The, the door was, you know, at Thanksgiving two years ago, it was a piece of cardboard and he was, you know, designing it. So it's just fun to see it go from the idea to this. The other guy that came was named David Olson. He was a fantastic asset to have because he knew Outback weather really well. I believe that at the present time we're, we're looking at some bad weather towards the last day, what we hope to be the last day of the race. Um, 
if we can get there and fast enough we should be able to avoid the worst of it. And then if we don't go fast enough we could run into some bad weather near Adelaide. With a solar panel you can see your power drop to near zero with a cloud in front of the sun and we think that if there's enough sun that we should be able to have enough energy in our batteries to make it down to Adelaide um, but it's really a, kind of a, a scary game to play when you don't know if you're gonna make it to the very end. I'll be driving the first shift which is exciting but it's probably one of the more complicated shifts just because you're in real city traffic. The nice thing is I've got, you know, the convoy knows what to do, we're rehearsed at this, we've done this, we're ready to go racing. On the first day of the race, the teams are released off the starting line uh, every 30 seconds or every minute or so. Getting out of Darwin was quite an adventure, and there were a lot of teams, it was just very dense traffic, a lot of passing, um, very chaotic. Over the course of the race, there's nine or 10 control points that teams hit in the biggest cities on the Stewart Highway every few hundred miles. The biggest cities might be a city with a population of 30. As the teams come in, their racing clock will stop for a period of 30 minutes, so teams can buy food and water for the next day of racing, refuel their escort vehicles. So this control point will do a little bit of work on the car uh, that's a little bit superficial, so things like checking for bugs on the array, making sure the tire pressure is okay. Basically, the thing is that you want to evaporatively cool the array and as they heat up, then we start spraying them. We use deionized water or demineralized water because it means that we're not leaving residue on the array. Yeah, okay. getting a little more power than expected. Yeah. Nuon, which is a team from the Netherlands, uh, their car Nuna 7 has uh, concentrators in it. So these are uh, magnifying devices, and that gets them a lot of extra power. It's legal, you do get a lot more sunlight onto every cell. Uh, Nuna and Twente uh, are in front of us. Uh, we passed Michigan a short while ago. Four. Michigan. Yeah. Uh -huh. Michigan's way back. They just pulled in. Yeah. So we have pretty good sun coverage right now. There's a bit of clouds, um, but based on our weather data, uh, the clouds should clear up pretty soon and hopefully we'll have clear blue skies uh, between here and the next control point. As the teams continue for the rest of the day of racing, before they get to the end of the race day at 5 p.m. each day, they'll have to try to scout out a place to spend the night. So what the team will do is quickly pull the vehicle to the side of the road and then oftentimes what they'll do is they'll take their array of the car, the solar panels, and try to prop them up so they can point the solar panels directly at the sun for the last uh, final hours of the day. Finally being in the race um, was definitely exciting, although that sort of wore off after the first hour, um, and then it was just a struggle to you know, keep wiping the sweat off your face, and <laughs> but it was, it was a good time. Two, one, oh. We're fourth now currently, um, and ahead of Michigan. I got to pass Michigan and looked over and grinned at their car while we were driving by. And as long as we stay in front of Michigan, uh, we'll be happy for now. Michigan Well, is Michigan back behind you, Zata? Uh, yes, Michigan is just down the road a little ways behind us. Oh, we didn't see them. We missed them. Oh, no. Good to know. <laughs> We set up the array stand, picking a position where we're going to get the most sun that we can. We need to rotate the back of the car closer yeah. to me. What they can say is, okay, I think that you should go up by this amount, and that's kind of eyeballing it based on angles that we can see. All right, that's pretty good. But then after they say, I think we should do this, they can actually check. We have a telemetry system, and so we're getting data from the car directly to a laptop. I can see the numbers. Okay, they can say, okay, we're getting five more watts than we had last time, so this is a good angle. Ready for food. <laughs> and then looking forward to the stars out in the outback. That's one of the coolest parts about camping out here. We wake up uh, before the sunrise. We get the array stand out, we push it upright, and we point directly at the sun. And then what people do is we adjust the angle of it back as the sun goes up, uh, still keeping it pointed directly at the sun. It was a nice, nice to camp in front of Michigan for the night. Uh, we'll see how long that trend can hold. Uh, but overall, things went really well yesterday, despite it being a very stressful and hot day. 
Uh, we were happy with how things turned out. The car's doing really well so far. Are we going to the rear fairings, guys? Fairings are the way we make the car aerodynamic uh, around the wheels. So the fairings come down off of sort of the main body of the car and shroud the suspension, the brakes, and the wheel, and the motor. Uh, and so the fairings are something you need to be able to get on and off to change tires. We took the fairings on and off a lot of times. Cut it. This is not. No. This is not on very well. No, you need to do it here. We're we have a special Okay, cut it. Cut it. Cut it. Cut it. Our team makes a large investment in ensuring that the people that go to Australia understand their roles and have a good sense of unity with their team members. There's definitely other teams that may have a lot more drama. So as much as we can, we try to avoid any kind of conflicts we would have um, at the last minute uh, when it comes down to actually racing across the outback. It wasn't really until uh, all, the cor all the cars were out in the race course we really knew um, how our team will stack up against Michigan and the Dutch team and the Japanese team Who's in chase? that had often uh, beaten us in years past. This year, the Stanford team had a, a couple of alumni from our project that uh, were tagging along with our team, uh, most of which were from uh, Google, actually. They were um, rooting our team along. They were also doing some uh, recruiting at the same time. What SolarCar does do that's really good is it's uh, just the absolute best training ground for, for new engineers to uh, really get some uh, experience under their belts before going off into the world. The last few people who have joined the Google X, um, well, self-driving team mostly, have been from like the Michigan Solar Car team, the Minnesota Solar Car team, and the Stanford Solar Car team. I guess I should say that Solar Car is about like 95% of the reason why I got my job. It's pretty hot. The car's feeling pretty good though. It's pretty stable. It feels good. And about how long were you driving and about how many kilometers? Uh, about oh, sorry, five hours. Do, sure. We're pretty happy with where we are right now. If you'd said two years ago that we'd be here, uh, we probably would not have believed you. Yeah, we're, we're excited to be top five so far. Really happy with how the car's doing. No major problems, no. Not yet. <laughs> You never know. Today I'll be the driver in the afternoon going from Tennant Creek where we currently are down to just a little shy of tea tree it looks like. Uh, I haven't seen the latest models but last I'd heard uh, we'd be pretty close to there tonight. Now, we're in the outback now and you can kind of tell. So it's a little more sane driving. Uh, you can r run your own race now as opposed to having to jockey with other teams a whole bunch. So it's a little more relaxed in that sense. Jamie, do you have a hammer? Yep. So we're camping up for the night and uh, getting ready to eat some steak. How's this? That's half a base. Michigan's still an undetermined but few kilometers behind us, so that's kind of fun to still be this close at that point. And Twente, we think, is about 20 to 25 minutes ahead of us. It's nice to be within 30 minutes of a podium at the moment. Good morning, sir. We're going to have to have a lot of people, though, to make sure it doesn't... It's going to want to tilt like this and hit the tail. <laughs> Famous Outback recipe. Ready for flipping? Yeah. It's containing kangaroo. Yeah, oh, I, got, I got the baby wallaby batch. Baby wallaby batch. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm, they're good. Dude, they're mad tasty. The food has been very good. I definitely can't say I was expecting to eat this well in the middle of nowhere. On this laptop, I have uh, a set of graphs and numbers um, that are reading live data off the car. Chase, solar car, car passing on the right. 
And the idea is that by looking at the live data off of the car, I can match that up to our predictions that we've made. So within a few minutes of noticing that we have more power in our battery uh, than we had originally planned, I can look at our numbers, see what speed we should go to kind of uh, match our predictions. The biggest city uh, that our team hits uh, over the course of the race is Alice Springs, which is right in the center of Australia. The Stanford team is well over halfway through the race now. Uh, we've been cruising anywhere between 85, just over 85 kilometers an hour on a daily basis right now, uh, which is uh, fast for our car, fast for a lot of teams. All right, brakes. My name's Peter Collins. My duties as an observer is to observe the activities of the team and record anything that uh, might be a little bit out of the abnormal and pass it on to the officials. So since leaving Darwin I've been with three different teams. Uh, it's good fun and of course coming home with all the teams is a wonderful experience because you do meet some young people who are our future and I think it's rather exciting to see them at work. Oh, you found some wood. Got the Barbie going. So yeah, if they're little, you don't. If they're, we're just trying to get them more like yeah. half size. Nine, ten, perfect. I cut the carrots and I got somebody to cut the broccoli. We're having um, curry tonight. I'm done. Our, our team is aware of some teams that have probably dropped out at this point in the race. There's uh, two Dutch teams, then one Japanese team that are still ahead of our vehicle. Uh, but in terms of the competition behind us, we're pretty far ahead. This one's got a few cuts, but nothing troubling. Anna, you check? Yeah. You check? Yes, okay. Everything has been going very well so far. The car has not broken down. We've been sticking within a few kph of our projected speed from the first day. We have plenty of battery pack. Uh, there's a lot of good sun right now. It looks like we're going to keep up a tailwind until we get towards the coast. Uh, and from there, it's kind of questionable what will happen. We're looking at a storm system kind of rolling in from the ocean when we arrive in Adelaide. So looking forward to another day of driving really fast. <laughs> We had uh, really strong tailwinds going into Cooper Pedy, so not all cars are built um, to handle these kind of a winds. Unfortunately, one of the cars, uh, University of Michigan, crashed today going into a control stop. Unfortunately, they're okay, but it's unclear what their status is in terms of uh, racing. But that'd be a pretty big upset for them. They've uh, been the fastest American team for about two decades. We started the day uh, 45 minutes behind Twente and are now five or six minutes behind him. It's cool to be right up there, you know, neck and neck with another team. It's pretty weird after, you know, 2,600 kilometers to be right on someone's tail. I think everyone is starting to get a bit uh, tired of camping in the outback. I haven't taken a shower since the morning of the race, uh, which would be four mornings ago. And we're soon coming up on some very fly-heavy areas. I'm not a fan of the flies. Tomorrow's gonna hopefully be our last day of racing. The next day we knew it was going to be cloudy, but it was a question of how much cloudy we would have to deal with and when and where the rain might hit us. This was a photo of us huddled around our laptops trying to decide what we were going to do on the last day of the race. So our decision that night was that if we got any bit of sun in the morning, we would try to catch Twente. And that meant that we were going to throw all of our best practices for race strategy out the window. And this was kind of a calculated gamble. We knew that if we caught them, it would be worth it. And if we didn't catch them and ran out of energy, we might be stuck on the side of the road. Good gamble, makes it fun, makes it exciting, makes it really, really freaking stressful on the last day. Yeah, so that last day, waking up six minutes behind Twente uh, was definitely exhilarating. We figured they probably had more on the battery pack than we did. Um, but we wanted to keep pressure on them, hoping they would make a mistake. We know they were worried about us. But it was really fun to be in an active race that late in the game against a team that uh, we all respect so much. We had a short drive from the place that we had camped the night, the night before to Port Augusta. We're at the last control stop right now. Uh, 
the Solar Team 20 is in third place and we're about 10 to 15 minutes behind them. So right now we just kind of have to uh, brave this terrible weather. But our team was trying to get the last potential wattage out of our solar array. So we had our team propping our vehicle up to get uh, a bit more sunlight to improve the power output of the solar panels. Hey Wesley, what time do we leave again just so we know? It's really going to be a, a race to Adelaide. Don't, don't know if we have enough sun to get there. Don't know if they do. If we got zero sun, we surely won't make it to Adelaide. Uh, it's about 200, 300 kilometers from here. It's just a question of how fast do we go to try to save some energy. It's a high stress time right now. Um, and after the 30 minutes were up, we had to jump in our convoy vehicles uh, and try to chase down uh, the Dutch team that was just ahead of us. So the rules of the race dictate that we must always be traveling at least about 35 miles an hour when we're on the road. Um, and for the last day, we went about 35 the entire way. The most stressful point in that drive from Port Augusta to Adelaide was when the motor had started to cut out already, meaning that it was very low uh, in battery pack. And, and we're coming up to the largest grade on that section of the, of the track or the race course. And we were at the bottom of it. <laughs> Uh, and it was raining very hard. My vision was highly obscured by fog, so I couldn't see very well. But halfway up, I realized, uh-oh, <laughs> we're not really going to make it. Luckily, there was a little rest stop and a pull out at the top of the hill. I personally needed to use the facilities as well as wipe out the conden condensation inside the cockpit. But once we got to the top, it was literally downhill from there. Fortunately, we only had to stop twice briefly. Unfortunately, the Dutch team 20 ahead of us had a bit more energy and they were able to pull away from us on the final day of racing. I feel really great. We just uh, finished with the car. We became third. We were pretty approached at uh, Stanford. And they were constantly like, uh, 15 minutes behind this, it was such, such a pleasure to uh, race with them. So I was really happy that we got a little bit of sun in those last 30 minutes or so they were able to drive us through the finish line. So my first error was stopping apparently about six inches short of the line. It was a really nice culminating experience getting fourth place. Last drive I'll ever have in a solar car. To America's number one solar car team. <laughs> Made it! Yeah! 3,000 kilometers. Got a little, got a little shaky at the end, but uh, trucked on through. Awesome. Like we're the first team to finish from Sanford in forever, and we did it properly. We didn't break down. I'm going to take a nice long shower and get rid of, rid of this red outback dust all on me. And then I'm going to take a long now. Yeah! <laughs> I'm so excited. So, so happy. I was so nervous. Nail biter. It was a nail biter. Feeling relieved. <laughs> Fourth place, best finish ever, I think, for Stanford. So, couldn't be much happier. Great, great. <laughs> we're uh, at the finish line and a timing, and uh, we're very, very happy. The next car we expect to hear, have here on the finish line will be the Stanford Solar Car Project from the United States. So what happened here is the Chief 
Chief Energy Scientist checks all the battery seals. Yep. Thank you very much. I like this this pack, it's nice. Not a speck of dust or anything on it. <laughs> Congratulations, a very nice well, thank pack. You. Yeah, thank it's you. really good. The team this year did very well. We're very happy with the results and having the best finish in Stanford's history. I was fabulous what they did. Um, uh, the team had been in a 20-year Australia rut. <laughs> and um, we're, we're thrilled that the team went and obliterated the 93 Stanford performance and uh, beat Michigan. Uh, really was the top all-student team in the world. Hats off to, to Wesley for heading it up and for everyone else for being a, a pivotal part of it as well. It's also using an award that goes to uh, teams um, that are recognized for their, uh, I guess, spirit in the, in the event itself. The 2013 Bridgestone World Soda Challenge, the David Fuchuk Spirit of the Event Award, is presented to Snodfart. Sorry, Stanford. Um, that's just an effort to recognize teams that um, are doing something special to make the, uh, the World Soda Challenge. Uh, really an exciting and fun event for uh, everyone involved. And uh, this award is yours as much as it is ours. Thank you, everyone. I would easily rank the Stanford Solar Car experience as my uh, top experience I've had here at Stanford, but uh, there's still um, some lingering stress, <laughs> I can say, uh, from uh, the last year and a half, and I'm sure I've taken months, if not years, off my lifetime by the amount of stress that I've gone through. One of the reasons that you can kind of justify to yourself putting so much time in it is because it's kind of something that society needs a little bit. So beyond just the educational thing, there's also a cool kind of pushing, showing society what's possible, you know? Maybe this much in energy to get from Darwin to Adelaide to start out. Almost um, 2,000 miles yeah, on a, a few bucks of energy if you were charging it off the grid. So... <laughs> it's yeah. not a bad deal. Yeah, it's not a bad deal. Uh, after I got back from uh, uh, being in Australia, uh, my I began my job search to find a full-time career and I just recently uh, joined Google um, working on their self-driving car project. What do you need? Right. So I'm graduating in June, going up to Yosemite for a week to relax, vacation, and go hiking. And then I'm going to start working at Google X, writing code as a full-time job. This just isn't flat. Yeah, I was working at Tesla uh, the spring and summer leading up to the race. So now I'm full-time at Tesla in the Battery Design Engineering Group. <laughs> There's no question that I would not have gotten my very first internship at Tesla without what I learned at Solar Car. I certainly hope that the university continues to you know, put resources behind this and, and, and also stay out of the way enough to provide a place that students can really have that, that freedom so they can you know, push the boundaries, you know, fail occasionally, learn from the failures, make mistakes. That was one of the, I think, instrumental parts of solar cars. There was never a safety net to prevent you from making you know, really bad mistakes. And you learn amazingly quickly in an environment like that. It's a little bittersweet to see it finally end, but I'm glad I got to go out on a very high note like this. And I have so much confidence in the people that are coming up. Um, we just had such a great group of young people join this year. <laughs> the team's in great hands. Uh, can't wait to see what comes next. That's what's really incredible about this experience to me is that you join as a you know, wide-eyed undergrad with no concept of you know, anything that you think would be useful to the car at all. And then you know, eventually you realize that at some point between Australia and where we are now, the, you know, the wand has been passed down and it's, um, it's our turn to build a solar car. <laughs>
So the students who are going to be on the panel, if I can get my mic working. Is my mic working? It'll turn on, I'll just okay. project. Okay, well let's have the students come up. I guess you're gonna have to stand. It's very, it's high tech here in some ways and not others, I guess. Um, and do you have a mic for everybody to share? So you might recognize some of these folks. <laughs> Uh, Ian Gerard, Max Praglin, Rachel Fenichel, Guillermo Gomez, Wesley Ford, and I didn't recognize him, <laughs> but that's um, Jamie Goldfield, who did not have a beard. <laughs> a little bit. You know. So um, some of you were on the, all of you, I guess, were on the team in 2013, and some of you are on the 2015 team, which we'll ask about a little bit. But I think my first question I wanted to direct to Wesley, and that is, did you find out if you are indeed related to the famous Henry Ford? If I'm related? Hello? Hello? Um, as far as I know, no. <laughs> but I'll have to dig back through my family records and all that to see maybe one day if I can find a trace back to the uh, Henry Ford family. All right. So I want to ask a question that I didn't get into in the film at all, and that is, um, this race has been going on for almost 30 years. Stanford's been doing it for 20 years. Um, why don't we have solar cars today? Wesley, do you would like to start that? Sure, so I think as you guys probably saw in the video, there's a lot of sacrifices that our team makes in order to make this vehicle be able to travel at highway speeds across the Outback. It's a very lightweight vehicle. There's basically zero creature comforts. It wouldn't really be the kind of vehicle you want to put your dog and your groceries in on a day-to-day -day basis to get from place to place. Um, the vehicle has solar panels on top, which provide about the same amount of power as a toaster or a hair dryer. And the truth of the matter is, the kind of cars we want to drive on a day-to-day -day basis um, to carry all of our kids and our groceries and all of that, they're heavy, they have a strong roll cage to protect you in a crash, and it'd be very difficult to actually um, drive a car on the amount of power that these vehicles run off of. So what our team does is we take a uh, kind of very uh, unique approach to driving across the con continent with these cars that may not be that practical, but we're doing it to show that there can be a role of having clean energy in the automotive industry. And maybe even though people wouldn't want to have one of these solar cars in their garage to drive to work every day, uh, we're trying to show that there can be that connection. So maybe you could have solar panels in your home charging an electric car in your driveway. Um, and uh, that's kind of the role that we're trying to show with these vehicles, even though uh, it may be a long ways off, if ever, that you could actually have a 100% solar powered car uh, sitting in your driveway at home. Does anybody else want to add it to that? And I think, oh, I mean, why don't we have at least these golf carts? Why can't they be? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. oh. Another thing we get to do is actually... This is on. It is. All right, another thing we get to do is actually push the boundaries of um, extreme efficiency in vehicles. So the aerodynamic optimization we've been doing um, for this 2015 car, we've actually done as a form of collaboration with Volkswagen to sort of improve their aerodynamic performance as well. Um, and being the second largest car maker in the world, it really makes a big difference when you can eke out more performance from a car using the same amount of gas or less. Um, so the name of the game is also extreme efficiency. And um, our car is about as efficient as it gets, but that is at the cost of so many safety factors and a lot of comfort that you would need for a real vehicle. Okay, but uh, why can't we have like golf carts or something that run on solar power? Any a lot of that comes back to the fact that it's more efficient to have your solar panels on your roof. You just you should put your solar panels on your roof. You should keep them clean. You should not park them under trees. 
things like that. But if you look at Stanford, you can actually see that, in some sense, Stanford has this little haven of electric vehicles. They've got these fleets of golf carts, and it's not just for occasional people to get around. It's for maintenance and all of that as well. And then they can buy clean energy or install uh, solar panels. And so they're doing the same thing, but being much more efficient about where they put the panels. Since you have the microphone, let me ask you. You, had said, you said in the film at the beginning that the solar project changed your life. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. Um, first off, I came in, thought I would be doing mechanical engineering at Stanford until I found computer science in my first quarter. And then I knew I was doing computer science. But I don't think I would have been doing something that would have been this hands-on. So I would have been doing something much more algorithm-related, um, a lot of that. But there's some really high impact from actually building that. And it also just translates to knowing that you can build just about anything you want to. And it's just a matter of how much time you put in and how much sleep you lose. <laughs> All of it. <laughs> Did you want to say something about why it changed your life? No. <laughs> well, I guess you could say it changed my life, too. I, like Garamo, actually dabbed my toe in the political science world for a bit and decided I just liked reading The Economist more. So backed away from that and stayed with mechanical engineering. But I thought I'd want to go into a more public speaking uh, style role. I was on the debate team, actually, as an undergraduate. And then I found Solar Car uh, my senior year. Uh, here, and I threw out the anchor and ended up taking three years to go through grad school just so I could do one more round of solar car. I fell in love with it that hard. So I was the 25-year-old that finally finished grad school in April last year, but it was because I wanted to do solar car, and that was the sole reason. Um, I don't regret it for a single second, and it has literally changed my life, not to mention the people I now call some of my very best friends that I met at 3 in the morning in a cold cement shop somewhere that way on campus. You, um, one thing you told me that I didn't, it wasn't in the film, was that th there's sort of a gap between what you learn in class and the real world of whatever, Tesla or wherever you happen to be. Yeah, I think that when that really hit home to me was when I realized that this thing we were building was going to be carrying someone I knew and cared about across the ground at highway speeds. Meaning if you do something wrong, your friend can get very hurt. And that's really different than a class. In a class, if you're working on a project and the night before, oh, it doesn't quite work, B plus it is. That doesn't work in solar car. A B plus isn't passable. It has to be A plus because you or your friends or other people on the road are affected by that. And that level of perfection that's required and of confidence in what you're doing is something you just are never going to get in a classroom setting. And it's not to say classes don't have their place, but you just get a much greater sense of responsibility when you realize you're doing something real that has real consequences. Um, and that I think makes you a much better engineer when you have to think through things in that regard, not what's going to get the most points, but what's going to keep people safe and make a better car and ideally go fast, too. Oh, yeah. Adding on to that, when I joined Solar Car, I showed up, and they said, do you fit in a box this size, and do you want to drive a solar car across Australia? And I said yes and yes. But then the, next, the first project that I had was driver controls on our 2011 car. And this is because I was a driver. So they said, you know what? You're responsible for cruise control. You're responsible for making sure that the steering wheel inputs and the brake inputs actually act properly. Um, and that really does bring it home to you. You know, you better get it right. <laughs> Max, I wanted to ask you a question. Yes. Sorry. This, um, you, the whole thing about um, Stanford doesn't give, you, it's an undergraduate project, like you said. There's only a little direction. I mean, you guys don't even get credit, right? No units? Uh, occasionally, we're able to find classes that are sort of independent studies or find ways to relate final projects to something we're doing on the car already. Um, but there's no solar car class that you can take. But do some of the teams get subsidies, or do they get their airfare paid? or? Uh, there's a range of things that go on on other teams. There's a lot of teams that will uh, you know, fund the entire thing uh, from a private sponsor. Um, there's teams that are all graduate students and their entire study uh, work is to build a solar car for a year or two. So for us having to do this on top of our classes, I think it's kind of nice in a way that it ties together what we're learning in the classroom and we do have that sense of responsibility and accomplishment when we get to the finish line. So you want to keep it independent or you don't, or is there more the university could be doing or? I, I think the university supports us in a really great capacity and um, I'm very pleased with how the team functions right now. I think it's definitely very uh, beneficial for everyone involved. And Jamie wanted to say something earlier. Oh, um, that was just going back to. Uh, That's okay. Okay. 
or just going back to also what you get in solar car that you don't get in class is um, I've certainly had plenty of class projects that I've you know kind of cobbled together um, and you know I had to d you 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 have like a demonstration you know on your final project day and it has to work once and that's fine um, and then it, it might break if you try it again but as long as the teacher sees it work once then you're fine um, but having a car that has to hold up for um, a grand total of about 10,000 miles when they're putting on it uh, is something that's pretty unique uh, it, at Stanford and that's uh, another thing that was really unique that I really got out of it. So I guess Jamie, Guillermo, and Max are on the current team that, that's going to race in October. So what can you tell us about the new car, what it looks like, what's cool about it, what's different, what its name is, when, are you gonna, when do we get to see it? <laughs> uh, name's still uh, to be determined. We kind of figure that out once we, uh, we know more what the car is going to be like. I'll let Max uh, talk a little bit more about the car, uh, what that's looking like, because they are just hitting some big milestones now, actually, which is... Exciting. Yeah, so in the past couple of days, we've been working with our mold maker um, who makes these really nice, beautifully polished molds that determine the outer shape of the car. So we have that set right now, and uh, we can tell you that it'll look uh, something like our old car and something like the winning cars. Um, and uh, <laughs> we're, we're hoping that it's going to be somewhere in the range of 10 to 15 percent more efficient. Um, and we think that's a goal that will help us. Uh, drive it to be faster, we'll get people learning, uh, and I don't think that we need to make any compromises to the project to get to that place. Should I ask for questions from the audience? Or do we have time? Yeah, we have a, a Does anyone have any uh, questions? Because well, hopefully they'll stick around later and you can talk to them in person. Yes? Can you give us some specs on the solar panels and the battery? Sure. Uh, we are allowed six square meters of silicon solar cells uh, or three square meters of gallium arsenide solar panels. Um, and our battery pack, uh, they give us an energy, uh, sorry, a mass uh, that we're allowed for different battery chemistries. So we have about 5.3 kilowatt hours in our battery pack. And what's the output of the solar panels? Uh, at peak, it's around 1,200 watts, um, but it kind of depends on how clean it is, how curvy the car is, and uh, also where in the world you are. We get quite a bit more in Australia than we do here. Roland. This uh, photo is foreshortened, but one of the things you notice is the difference between the angle of the front and the back of the car. Did you calculate and optimize the angle approach to the sun so that you, you had that set? Is it better than having it flat? I'd like to say that we did. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, we do actually optimize that, so Max can talk more about the aerodynamics, but one of the really cool programming projects that happens also is um, simulating uh, the, I think it's called Shell Power is our program that someone on the team wrote, simulating what amount of sun we'll get for a given uh, configuration. So we kind of run that as we iterate on the aero bodies to get better at it. Yeah, so what you're noticing, um, that tilt of the solar array, is something that we're trying to emulate, um, but it's really uh, not feasible to do when you have so many other things that come first. Um, so the top teams that are really uh, getting everything perfect are doing that. And when we're trying to learn something, we're starting from scratch every time. Uh, that's not always something that we can hit, but we, we are starting to investigate, you know, what is the average angle that you're driving during the race? Where is the sun going to be? Um, and those are factors that we want to be putting into our design. And, and I just want to point out here that this vehicle is the winning car from Delft Nuon. And that's Stanford's car. That model, as you'll see the drivers in the middle, which Max referred to as the fat body model. And this is the, uh, what is it called? Uh, catamaran. Catamaran, where the driver's over here. So the two, two top teams were catamaran, and then the third and fourth were the fat body. Is there, what do you think is their advantage? Is the new car going to be one or the other? Have they changed the rules? Or? Uh, the rules will allow you to do either one. Um, the one advantage that you see from the catamaran cars is that you can put the driver in line with the wheels. So you don't pay the aerodynamic penalty of your wheels and then your driver again. So there's some real benefits there, but if you start looking at the vehicle dynamics side of it and having a car that's not balanced left to right, you end up with some really tough challenges. So I, I would say that it's a harder thing to pull off, um, but uh, the reason that we chose the um, driver in the center design last time, uh, one of the reasons is just that it's easier to pull off, we're more confident about it. Um, and we're sure that we can build a better car if it's that way. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm curious what the role is of a faculty advisor and how that's changed over the years from the inception of the project. 
Yeah, so our, our team has uh, involvement by faculty on the campus in a few different means, um, one of which is a advisory board that our team has comprised of anywhere from eight to 10 members of the Stanford faculty, uh, both administrators and professors um, that serve a couple of functions. Um, there is some kind of administrative oversight in terms of making sure our team complies with campus policies and Santa Clara law and all that. Um, but they also support our team in a lot of uh, relief ways. So on one hand, uh, some of the professors that are on that faculty board uh, can give us insight. We'll sit down with design reviews with that team uh, to go over suspension design or other aspects of our vehicle uh, dynamics. Um, plus, uh, we also have some other faculty on the board that can help us out with uh, community partnerships and relations uh, with our team trying to find new sponsors. Um, so our, our team has been very happy actually with having uh, support from the faculty where we need it, um, but not too much oversight. Uh, we've talked to other teams, especially uh, in other parts of the world and other parts of the US even, where uh, campus administration and legal concerns and uh, other issues along those lines can create a lot of burdens for teams and teams have been uh, shut down or uh, severely compromised by uh, concerns within, their, within the university. But for us here at Stanford, um, our team has had a, a ton of great support from uh, both the campus faculty, um, professors, administrators, and uh, everyone in between. I have one quick question, and that is, everybody's always amazed at how lightweight the car is. How much does it weigh, approximately? So I think our total mass was, what, 375 pounds? Yeah, I think that's what, what the weight was. So adding the driver adds a bit more. Um, so it's an incredibly lightweight car. Um, Two people can pick it up with some difficulty, um, but as you saw probably in the video clips a few times, uh, we used to have a small team of people. Um, so around the same weight as a motorcycle, maybe a heavy motorcycle, um, and that's what allows our team to be able to drive at highway speeds, uh, even with a small amount of power being produced by the solar panels on top of the vehicle. Yes, sir. I noticed that forward to aft cross section, it appears to be a classical airport. So is the car lighter when it's in motion? So uh, th that's one of the things our team looks into is uh, the effect of that airfoil itself on the, uh, the downforce the car would have on the ground. Um, and it's one of the biggest variables that we have the ability to manipulate in determining the overall drag of the vehicle. Um, you can have a lift-induced drag in the vehicle uh, as you increase or decrease the uh, lift or downforce in the vehicle. So our team, for the most part, tries to minimize the amount of lift or downforce the vehicle would have so we can minimize the amount of forward force that it takes to drive the vehicle. Um, we do factor in a very small amount of downforce just as a kind of margin of safety so that uh, the vehicle would tend to uh, be pressed towards the ground as opposed to being lifted. Um, if you look online, I'm sure you can find some videos of Le Mans cars or other vehicles that get picked up in the wind and toppled over. So we try to avoid that. And uh, one of the things that our team does that um, not very many solar car teams actually do is we'll take the full vehicle and bring it into a wind tunnel to once again validate uh, our models that we've been simulating on computers, but also to fine tune uh, things like the lift of the airfoil itself. Um, and we'll take each vehicle um, to uh, North Carolina, where we've been going for the past few years, uh, to a wind tunnel there to do our uh, testing. Well, I think we're going to now end our uh, presentation here and have the reception. Um, I would like to thank the team for giving me the opportunity. <laughs>